Uh, my uh, commission is to, to study the question whether and to which extent a participatory society might benefit from two widely acclaimed economic practices, the sharing economy and the social market economy. I shall uh, start off in the first part with an outline of the political economy of participation. Uh, this will allow me to clarify the fundamental definitions and to highlight the main economic mechanisms that come here into play. In part two, then I'll uh, come to talk about the social market economy. And in part three, I'll come to talk about the sharing economy. Part one was initially not at all planned in my paper, and this is what really helped me up. And uh, uh, fortunately, I so attended the first day of this conference, and I realized to which extent the, the, the problems that I confronted in systematically dealing with my subject was related to the fundamental definitional issues, which were, and I was happy to see that the other speakers were really not much more advanced than, than I was, so I decided then over the weekend not to attend the uh, wonderful excursion to Castel Gandolfo, but to spend more time thinking through these conceptual problems. So I, my, my paper is now a little bit awkward because half of it uh, consists of a discussion of the general theory of uh, economics of participation, and then the rest uh, is, is added. So, but I hope it will be in the sense of the organizers. Okay, so we'll start off with uh, the uh, e political economy of a participatory society. In economics, there is currently no field called the economics of participation or the economics of social integration. The expression participatory society comes from other disciplines and it needs to be defined in such a way that the underlying phenomena can be discussed with the tools of economic analysis. As we shall see, this can be conveniently done. There are strong affinities between the economics of participation and the general theory of the division of labor. I shall use the word participation synonymously with the expression social integration. Participation can be defined most conveniently in conjunction with its opposite, which is marginalization, respectively exclusion. Marginalization and exclusion are usually defined in two very different meanings, both of which are useful for certain analytical purposes. One of them is the larger, the other narrower. In the larger sense, to be marginalized means not having certain economic goods. In the narrow sense, it means being a victim of other people's privileges. The second meaning focuses on one of the possible causes of not having a desired economic good. Indeed, being the victim of another man's privilege means that one is not as equal before the law, that he may do certain things that I may not, and that he may, for this reason, have certain economic goods that I do not have. The biggest problem of defining exclusion in the sense of not having is that it implies a patronizing point of view which, in practical applications, can lead to grave policy errors. It is patronizing in that it presupposes to know what is worth having and what not. It neglects the crucial fact that economic goods cannot be defined by their physical characteristics. They can only be defined from the point of view of the subjective values of the persons that are concerned. In our study, I uh, have used a variant of the first definition. Rather than defining exclusion as not having, I define it as not cooperating with other persons in a division of labor. This definition allows us to adopt the point of view of the acting persons. It avoids taking a stance on what is worth having and what not. And it still leads to gradual distinctions. Each person cooperates with some people. Each person is excluded from cooperation with other people. Exclusion and inclusion go hand in hand. I cannot be simultaneously at a meeting of the Pontifical Academy and with my family or with my students. The packages of ex exclusion and inclusion result from various causes. Some are freely chosen, some result from coercion. The central driving uh, forces, the central mechanism of social integration is the division of labor. To specialize means to produce certain economic goods in excess of one's personal needs. It means to become dependent on the productive efforts and on the goodwill of other people. It means to become part of a larger whole. The transition from a primitive economy to the division of labor is the transition from atomistic homogeneity to organic complementarity. 
the activities of one hunter-gatherer are similar to those of any other hunter-gatherer. Each one cares for himself, and they are all the same. Yet each member of a division of labor does something that the others do not quite do. His activities are complementary to those of the others. The various individual activities combine into a meaningful whole. Specialization builds and shapes individual personalities. Plato, St. Thomas Aquinas, Adam Smith, David Ricardo, Ludwig von Mises, and countless other great thinkers have underscored that human beings do associate because of the material advantages that they derive from cooperation. The classical economists have demonstrated that such material benefits exist under all conceivable circumstances. Most notably, they exist even in those cases in which a weaker person associates with stronger persons. Irrespective of whether the terms weak and strong refer to physical force, intelligence, or wealth. Through specialization and exchange, a weak and a strong can produce and use more economic goods than without specialization and exchange. This is tantamount to saying that they have material incentives to create a participatory society, at least as far as their immediate associates, including business partners, employees, suppliers, and customers, are concerned. Indeed, the division of labor needs peace between the associates, but true peace is the fruit of justice. Aristotle famously stressed the intimate relation between exchange and justice. Where social relations are asymmetric, where they are in unequal, cooperation cannot develop, it cannot fully develop. The weaker side to a biased trade, the exploited, the marginalized, will be reluctant to go along with the scheme. They will take part only as far as necessary. They will watch out for the opportunity of rebellion, and thus the potential for cooperation is stimmied from the outset. The division of labor is not the only driving force of the market economy. It is also the foundation of all non-commercial human communities, most notably families, churches, cultural associations, and nations. Insofar as these communities need economic goods to nourish and perpetuate themselves. This implies that the material advantages resulting from the division of labor are also a cause of the solidarity that reigns between the members of the different communities. Solidarity is rooted in real community of shared experiences and shared aspirations. To some extent, it is prior to the division of labor. There can be no cooperation if there is not from the outset a modicum of peace and trust. Some what could be called originary solidarity, is therefore the foundation on which the division of labor is built. But this does not alter the fact that solidarity is also a consequence of the division of labors. Uh, individuals merge into communities because the division of labor in which they are engaged creates a common past and a common future with the other associates. Community and solidarity with these associates are the consequence of joint production. The market economy is the most important manifestation of the division of labor, rivaled and complemented only by non-profit activities of the civil society. Now this conclusion might appear to be paradoxical. How can it be that private property promotes a participatory society? After all, the very nature of private property is to deny other people access to the economic goods that are privately owned. Uh, private comes from privation, after all, right? And to reserve this access to the sole owners. The paradox is easily resolved, though, once it is appreciated that in this case, as in many others, the macroeconomic or global effects are different from the microeconomic ones. The longer run effects are different from the short run effects. Most notably, private property plays an important role in preemptive conflict resolution. It reinforces responsibility. It focuses the attention of the owners on the protection and development of the economic goods that they control. They thereby naturally slip into the role of caretakers and stewards. Private property also, also greatly facilitates decision-making in the context of painful trade-offs. 
which might divide the opinions of the members of any larger community. And it facilitates choices that relegates short-run interests behind long-run objectives. Such choices often go in hand with significant short-run sacrifices and their future outcomes are uncertain. Without strong owners, such choices are rarely made. Among stakeholders, there is usually a bias in favor of carrying on with current practice because people cannot bring themselves to agree on what should be done. Private property helps to correct this bias because the long-run benefits are concentrated in relatively few hands and can therefore tip the balance in favor of longer-run considerations. To sum up then, the relationship between private property and the participatory society is a dialectical one. Apparently, social cooperation increases even though resources are owned privately. But in fact, social cooperation increases precisely because they are owned privately. Let me now highlight the economic factors that promote social integration. I've, we have seen that the central driving force of the letter is the division of labor, both within and without the market economy. The division of labor depends in particular on three factors. On the quantity and quality of capital goods, on entrepreneurship, respectively the ingenuity of the allocation of available factors of production, and third, on the opportunity costs of social integration through the division of labor. Adam Smith famously observed that the division of labor is limited by the extent of the market. It is less frequently remembered that he also stressed that the extent of the market depends on the part of revenue that is saved and invested. He was right on that point too. A savings-driven growth process leads to an extension of the division of labor within the market economy. But an increasing a volume of savings eventually also spills over into the nonprofit sector. The reason is that the increased supply of savings tend to drive down the return on capital. Uh, this is what the Marxists call uh, the uh, law of the declining rate of profit. There are ever less incentives to use the available wealth in for profit activities. And as the funding of nonprofit activities grows, more and more people find employment in the organizations running churches, clubs, schools, etc. So far, I've discussed the basic mechanisms of social integration under the tacit hypothesis that no economic good is acquired without the consent of the previous owner. Now, we need to drop this hypothesis and consider the consequences that follow from violations of private property rights. I will focus on the most relevant scenario in which such violations are perpetrated by the government, and I shall call them government interventions, or in short, interventions. There are repressive interventions and there are permissive ones. Unfortunately, this uh, distinction is not very often made in the literature. The repressive interventions limit the ability of current owners to use their property as they see fit. Such interventions are manifest mostly in prohibitions, regulations, and forced payments. Permissive interventions enable the beneficiaries to do certain things that they would not have be, uh, able to do under the common law. They do so most notably by bending the rules, so creating special privileges for certain people, and also by subsidizing them at the expense of the taxpayers. Now this is a rather long section, so I cannot present this entirely here. I will focus on um, uh, repressive interventions and then especially on permissive interventions in the form of uh, monetary interventions. Prohibitions, regulations, and taxes have one thing in common, they raise costs. When firms are subject to additional repressive interventions, the costs of doing business increase, which means that profit margins shrink. This implies diminished incentives to save and diminished incentives to deploy the available savings as capital. The division of labor is therefore stifled, upward social mobility is hampered, the participatory society is to some extent compromised. Regulatory interventions deserve special notice, not only because they are more difficult to measure than government tax revenues and government spending, but also because their impact is even more asymmetrical, non-neutral, than the impact of taxation. Indeed, most taxes are proportional to some monetary variable like capital, profit, wages, or wealth. 
This does not mean that they do not privilege one type of business relative to another. No taxation can be neutral in this sense. However, because it is proportional, taxation does not increase any systematic bias in favor of large companies or large agglomerations or political connected businesses. Things are different in the case of regulations. They usually come one size fits all and affect all firms and households to the same extent. That is, they do not just entail relative increases of business costs, but absolute ones. And this tends to create a particularly strong negative impact on marginal market participants. Firms that just may barely make it, employees that are just good enough to find a job, etc. Usually regulations are motivated by good intentions, especially when they concern labor relations and the protection of consumers. But a time-honored adage tells us that the road to hell, too, is paved with good intentions. Let me now focus on monetary interventions. Monopolies are contested in all walks of business life. Socialism is long since discredited, but the monopoly of central banks is today an article of faith and money socialism a matter of course. This state of affairs reflects the sorry state of mainstream economic thinking on almost all issues related to money, banking, and finance. Most economists are convinced of the expediency of central banks, of fiat money, of ex nihilo money creation, of cheap credits out of the printing press, of a flexible money supply, and of expansionary monetary policy. I myself disagree very thoroughly with these ill-held convictions, but this is not the place to discuss them. My present concern is the relationship between monetary interventionism and social integration. Monetary interventionism is the quintessence of permissive interventions. Today, all central banks create fiat money out of nothing. There is no technical or commercial limitation to the production of fiat money, and the remaining legal limitations are few in number and constantly tested before the courts. As from the Genoa Conference in 1922, central banks have coordinated themselves in order to facilitate expansionary monetary policies. After World War II, these policies have produced near uninterrupted price inflation. This is an important point. Uh, price inflation, as we know them, is, this is the uh, life experience of all of us in, in this room, is relatively new. It has not existed before World War II. The consequence has been the phenomenon of financialization. Indeed, when the level of money prices rises permanently and predictably, households and non-financial firms have strong incentives to behave like financial agents. They start to leverage their investments and hold a large part of their wealth in the form of financial assets. To leverage an investment means to finance it with credits, most notably with credits coming from ex nihilo money creation. Credit is particularly cheap and alluring when the interest rate is lower than the expected price inflation rate. This has been the case in most countries in the Western Hemisphere most of the time after World War II. With rising debt comes the necessity of risk management to avoid default, and the simplest way to increase one's liquidity is to hold more wealth in the form of financial titles rather than in the form of real estate or industrial property. Financialization has uh, four momentous implications for the participatory society, and I will discuss just here the, the first three. The first one is the disengagement of property owners, especially the owners of industrial property. Schumpeter, in his Capitalism, uh, Socialism, and Democracy, has noticed the evaporation of the substance of property many years ago. He saw this evaporation rooted in the rise of shareholder capitalism, which in those years had supplanted the model of owner entrepreneurs. His observation is right on target, but it deserves to be pointed out that shareholder capitalism is premised on permissive interventions. There would be no significant market for shares, there would be no significant stock market in commercial enterprise in the absence of limited liability for civil responsibility. And most of the corporations could not have grown very fast without the cheap credit out of ex nihilo money production. Today, the evaporation of the substance of property is manifest in the blatant disinterest of many startup entrepreneurs in their firms. And the hairs of many established industrial firms are just as indifferent. They see their industrial property above all as collateral needed to obtain cheap credit with which they grow the firm to a larger scale before selling off and cashing in. 
Clearly, such an attitude undermines the long-run potential of any industrial enterprise. It is one thing to be tied to a firm, often handed down from one generation to the next, with all of one's emotional and material fortune. It is another thing to be a temporary user trying to maximize profits over seven years. The demise of the over owner entrepreneur drastically reduces the entrepreneur's decision-making horizon, both intellectually and as far as investments are concerned. It reduces the efforts made to cultivate strategic long-run human resources. It subverts the community between the owner, the employees, the suppliers, and the customers. Second, financial financialization draws great numbers of the most gifted and well-trained young people into the financial sector. Their behavior is entirely rational and acceptable from a microeconomic perspective. They make the best use of their talents to provide for themselves, for their families, and for all the causes they cherish. But from a macroeconomic perspective, it seems to be rather disastrous if year after year, thousands of young mathematicians and engineering graduates use their time and ingenuity to find ways to leverage investments ever more. It is certainly one of the most wasteful internal brain drains ever devised. The foregoing considerations can be generalized into a third remark. Financialization entails a thoroughgoing revolution of priorities and values as they bear on economic organization. The factors that have the, the greatest impact on the bottom line within seven years are not the same that are most relevant over a lifetime or over several genera generalizations, general generations. The services that are most helpful in a debt economy are different from those that count most when there is no debt. A debt-ridden economy and highly regulated economy is a world of bewildering legal, financial, and economic complexity. Optimizing short-run returns in such a setting is a daring intellectual challenge, and it is very well paid too. This is the ideal playing field for highly trained lawyers, accountants, economists, mathematicians, and so on, whether their work is in politics, public administrations, or private firms. Their services are needed to cope with this complexity, and now that's really the clue. They themselves relentlessly add on to it. Now, the crucial consideration is now the following, namely that this process feeds on itself as long as it is sustained by monetary accommodation coming from the central banks. In other words, there is no saturation mechanism that would diminish the value of the services provided by the aforementioned provisional groups. Usually what you have in any economic activity is the op operation of the law of diminishing marginal value. And as uh, you get more of a service, more of any economic good, its uh, a marginal utility diminishes. So at some point, the, the, the prices and the revenues diminish. Here, in this case, as long as the central bank backs it up and the central bank has unlimited resources to do so, in principle, uh, uh, there is no stopping point. This implies that all other services from manual labor over product development to the simple act of plain saving become less important, at least in relative terms. The remunerations of gardeners, bakers, shoemakers, product engineers, and savers therefore diminish relative to the rewards gained by the aforementioned professions. It should be clear that this process is especially detrimental to the most fragile members of society but it is also frustrating to, for all others who do not have any special training, ability, or inclination to deal with financial, accounting, investment, or regulatory matters. It pitches those that do against those who do not. It builds up conflicts without providing a safety valve. So now I'm prepared to say a few things about the market economy and uh, <laughs> the sharing economy. You see, I have six minutes left, okay, so I'll try to make it short. Uh, the social market economy stripped to its logical core is the third way policy between pure capitalism and pure socialism, one of the countless third ways that have been proclaimed and tried out since the 19th century. The main point at any rate as far as my present research question is concerned is that the SME is not conducive to a participatory society. Its auto-liberal foundation, it is true, is only moderately repressive. In practice, the anti-cartel policies of uh, the social market economy have not significantly hampered the growth of successful West German firms after World War II. And the Bundesbank was arguably the least permissive of all major central banks in the world. 
But this does not alter the fact that the SME boils down to a combination of moderately repressive and moderately permissive interventions. One could argue that the social market economy has benefited social integration in post-war Germany, at least to some extent, for psychological reasons. Because the citizens felt reassured by the idea that a benevolent government was watching over them. But even then, we must raise the question whether this benefit was not another one of those short-run benefits that governments can provide, and which they do provide very eagerly to their political constituencies, but which turn out to be detrimental in the longer run. Would it be really far-fetched to see a causal connection between the reassurance that the citizens might feel thanks to social policies on the one hand, and the many symptoms of social disintegration that plague contemporary Germany on the other hand? Are high divorce rates and increasing refusal to marriage and have children unrelated to the repression of the freedom of matrimonial contracts? Is long-term unemployment unrelated to unemployment relief? Is the single mother epidemic unrelated to welfare payments for single parents? A sober look at the mechanisms that are here at work leads to the conclusion that the good press that the SME enjoys, especially in Germany itself, though not perhaps completely undeserved, needs to be nuanced in many respects. I do not contest that the SME has contributed to the successful renaissance of the German economy after the disaster of national socialism. My contention is that whatever its contribution, it came at a price that has still not been fully paid. And now a few words about the sharing economy. Oh, now I need to be really concise. Okay, so what do I tell you? The uh, sharing economy uh, revolves around internet-based firms such as Airbnb and Uber. In their public relations, these firms stress the benefits that non-professional owners of capital goods, such as private vehicles and private apartments, might derive from their services. Thanks to Airbnb and Uber, such goods may become a source of revenue, but of course, they may also be shared gratuitously. In any case, the new technology allows to make resources available to a larger set of people than just their owners with their rather narrow circle of friends and relatives. Sharing is a form of social integration, and in a general sense, it is the form of social integration. The very meaning of sharing, after all, is to have something in common with other persons, and thus to be bonded to these others rather than be separate from them. All communities are based on shared experiences, shared problems, shared convictions, and shared aspirations. It is therefore natural to suppose that the sharing economy might provide valuable lessons for the construction of a participatory society. However, this hypothesis needs to be analyzed carefully. Sharing is, of course, not new. Neither are the practices of the sharing economy fundamentally new. The expression sharing economy is very much a buzzword that has been invented by interested parties for marketing purposes, and which then came to lead an existence of its own, a memification. An increase of sharing is not tantamount to increased social integration. Increased sharing always goes in hand with advantages for some people as well as disadvantages for other others. It can be a symptom of social disintegration and it can be a cause of social disintegration. Oui, je, je suis en train de le faire, merci. Uh, consider property held in indivision, as is often the case with goods received in an inheritance. The heirs who share an estate do not necessarily grow closer in friendship to one another. As many families know, such a situation might entail exactly the opposite. The heirs are likely to disagree on the best use of the property and to quarrel about usus, fructus, and abusus. Sharing then is the cause of strife rather than of friendship and cooperation. Now I conclude on the sharing economy. I conclude the, the general paper. Uh, I've uh, studied the question into which, uh, whether and to which extent a participatory society might benefit from the social market economy and the sharing economy. I've based my analysis on the preliminary discussion of economic mechanisms of participation and exclusion. And in the light of these mechanisms, it appears that the social market economy is not per se and not categorically conducive to a participatory society. It contains elements that are useful in this regard, but only in the short-run perspective. Similarly, 
in my examination of the sharing economy, I've stressed that not all forms of sharing are susceptible to reinforce social integration. Increased sharing can be a symptom of social disintegration and it can be the cause of social disintegration. And for the details, I must refer to you to the paper, and, but I'll be available to answer questions in this regard. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>